so good afternoon, everyone. Hope uh, everyone had a good lunch. And uh, today I'll be talking about a topic which is very crucial for all embedded systems, which is doing clock and power management. And this is specifically focusing on ARM SCMI, which we'll look at what it is in this talk. A few disclaimers. This is a technology presentation and uh, not a product readiness or roadmap. And the opinions here uh, may not reflect that of TI. A little bit about my company. So I'm from Texas Instruments, and TI strongly believes in uh, open source culture. We always believe that whatever software development we do in-house, we should upstream it first. So you can take a look at all of these various open source projects that TI is involved in, including Linux, uh, AOSP, uh, OpenAMP, U-Boot, Zephyr, et cetera. A little bit about the speakers. Uh, my name is Dhruva, and I'm a Linux kernel engineer at TI. I primarily focus on power management in the Sitara SOCs. And uh, I also take uh, a look at U-Boot, uh, ARM trusted firmware, and Linux device driver development. Uh, my co-author is Kamlesh. He works on the security and power management side of things. Uh, and he also uh, works on U-Boot, uh, ARM trusted firmware, Opti, as well as Linux. Uh, I'll divide this talk in two major chunks. Uh, in the first half of which the overview I've given here, I'll focus on introducing the audience to what SCMI is and the basics of clock and power management. And in the second half of the talk, I'll try to cover what remains to be implemented in the protocol, some improvements that we think can make uh, this protocol better. Uh, so let's dive right into it. A little bit of background. Uh, let's cover the basics of what is power and clock management. So each SOC that we have today, since SOCs have gotten incredibly complex, they have been split into multiple power domains to offer more granularity. So these domains can be individually turned on or off based on requirement. And uh, any entity in the SOC can request a particular power domain to be turned on or off depending on if it is going to be using the component from that power domain. So uh, you have this central firmware entity, uh, which you can use to power on or off the domain, which we'll look at slightly later. And here's a basic uh, clock management overview. What we have is a PLL, which is sort of a source clock. And then that same PLL goes further into a divider and then into a multiplexer and then finally to the peripheral. So as you can see, there is a complex clock trees that you need to configure just to get the right frequency to your peripheral. This is just an example of a complex SOC that we have. Uh, it's based on the K3 architecture. It is the AM62. On the top left, you can see is the Cortex A53 cluster, which runs Linux. Then we have the MCU M4 core and various, various other peripherals that are inside this SOC. So the question is, how are you going to manage all of it? Um, so you have multiple ARM-based MCU and MPU cores, which are your processing entities. You have something like Linux running on the Cortex-A cores. Then you have, for example, an MCU firmware running on the MCU core. And then in our devices, we have something that we call as the device management firmware that is running on another Cortex-R5 core. Now this is the central entity that is responsible for clock and power management. Now, a uh, question for the audience. How do you think will all of these various entities uh, talk to this uh, central entity, the device manager, for requesting clock or power domains? Uh, you can pass this mic. Any guesses? Shared memory? Sure, that's an excellent answer. So shared memory is one of the ways through which this uh, communication can take place. But again, what you described is just the hardware layer. But we do need a standard software layer as well, because they need to communicate in the same language that everyone can understand. So thus arose a need for a standard protocol, because you may have different mediums of transport in the hardware. 
but how you communicate is going to be a software protocol. So one of the major players at that time, uh, TI, came up with our own TI-SCI protocol for solving these challenges. So any entity in the SOC that had this TI-SCI driver uh, could now request for clock or power from this DM. So it can be Linux or any MCU firmware. It just has to follow the protocol. So this is just a photo of the patch when we first introduced it back in August 2016. And soon after, ARM followed uh, by introducing a standard ARM SCMI protocol, which is the system control and management interface. So it is uh, somewhat similar to the TI-SCI protocol. Uh, and instead of the DM firmware that I talked about earlier, ARM recommends the SCP firmware which is an open source project, by the way, on GitHub. And this central entity uh, does not necessarily have to be uh, SCP firmware. It can also be implemented inside ARM trusted firmware, which runs on your Cortex A cores itself. So here's the photo of the patch where ARM started to add support for SCMI inside Linux. So as you can see, it's almost a year after, in, uh, in June 2017. Let's look at uh, one more interesting concept called as the performance domain management, uh, where you have the ability to control performance of a domain that is composed of various compute engines. Now, uh, here, uh, catch is that the set of devices uh, that always have to run at the same performance level are kind of grouped into performance domains. And it operates on an abstract integer scale. So it can be anything uh, like uh, actual frequency values or even abstract values that's up to the implementation. Here are some of the additional protocols that SCMI supports today. Uh, power domain, system power management, performance, clocks, uh, etc. Let's have a look at how TFA, Linux, and SCMI come together. Here's a diagram that represents uh, an example system. So on the Cortex-A core, we have Linux. Inside Linux, what I've shown is uh, power and clock drivers, just for reference. And these drivers are located inside drivers from where I'm SCMI inside the Linux kernel. So you're free to go and look at them later on. Now, uh, from there, we go into the protocols layer. So whatever peripherals of yours are requesting for power or clock, they then go into the protocols layer, then into the transport layer. Like uh, he said, we need a hardware transport mechanism like shared memory or mailbox. And from the transport layer, it goes onto the platform controller. So in this case, it can be a SCP firmware or a device manager firmware. Now, after it goes there, it again requires a protocol layer to decode what actually it received. And then it routes it internally into vendor-specific power or clock drivers. Now, one small entity that you can see on the bottom left is the Cortex-M4. So we covered the Linux part, but what will uh, a general purpose MCU do in such a system? So it again can implement this SCMI protocol inside its firmware. And using that, and by using a channel to communicate with the SCP firmware, uh, it can also request for clock or power. Here's a simpler system where you don't have an SCP firmware or you don't have a general purpose MCU. So you simply have Linux, or let's consider a device which simply has a Cortex-A core, and you have Linux running on the non-secure side and uh, TFA executing on the secure EL3 level. So uh, from Linux, we have the same stack that I explained earlier. But now what changes is the transport layer is now going to be SMC, which I'll cover shortly. It uses this transport layer to communicate into ARM-trusted firmware. And then within the same core, it switches context. And then the TFA side of things have the vendor-specific power and clock drivers. And uh, they do the job of powering on or off clocks and power domains. So how can Linux really talk to TFA? Linux, as I said, runs in the non-secure or EL1 privilege. But TFA runs at EL3, which is the highest privilege level. Here's where the concept of SMC comes in. SMC is, again, another ARM-specific concept. Uh, you can refer to this document by ARM, uh, which talks about this SMC calling convention. Inside SCM, uh, we can use that as a transport layer. So we have two different SCMI transports. One is fast channel and shared memory. So today, I will mainly be covering uh, shared memory kind of an approach. Uh, 
So let's look at how you can use SCMI on your devices. Some of the terminology that I'll be using is agent. So agent is describing the caller of this SCMI interface. Uh, in, for example, let's take it to be Linux. Then platform is going to be the set of hardware components that are going to interpret these messages and provide the necessary functionality. And then transport, as I explained, is the method by which you get these messages across. Let's start by implementing SCMI inside TFA, which is the most bottom layer of things. Now, not every protocol that I showed earlier has to be present inside your implementation. Oof. Otherwise, it would have been a major headache. And uh, the platform chooses what protocol it requires. So if you just need clock and power management, you're free to do that. But if you need all of the features, you're free to do that as well. So the base protocol is the only protocol that TFA really mandates. And uh, the reason for that is that your agent has to discover. So for example, how will Linux know what kind of protocols are supported by the firmware entity? So we use the base protocol to try and discover what all protocols are going to be available. Here's a list of all the protocols again, but this time I've included the protocol ID on the left-hand side. So you have uh, all these uh, hex-coded protocol IDs that you will have to put inside your device tree and even inside of the TFA layer. This is how you essentially identify which protocol you're going to be using. Now TFA will require SCMI drivers. And so let's look at what are the platform specific drivers that you will have to add. On the SCMI side of things, we'll cover clock, power, and performance. And then on the SVC side of things, which I will cover shortly, is the SIP SMC handler and the runtime service descriptor. What is SVC? So SVC is an instruction, basically. It's uh, like a, literally an assembly instruction that uh, is used to perform system calls. So whenever you want to switch from Linux or do a call from Linux into TFA, you use the SVC instruction. And uh, what happens is once this instruction executes, your registers, uh, like many of you may have used debuggers, and if you connect to one of these Cortex-A cores, you see X1, X2, X3 kind of registers. So these registers are going to be now available as shared information between the secure and non-secure worlds. Here's an example of a code snippet where I'm defining a runtime service descriptor. So I've just called it as K3SVC. And uh, on the bottom, I have also described the SMC handler that I'm going to use. So what is an SIP SMC handler? Essentially, when that SVC call happens and you're switching context, now you need some function inside TFA to actually understand, OK, why have I switched context? So this is where the SMC handler comes into the picture. As I talked about earlier, your X1 to X4 registers are kind of now going to be your context. And based on that, you can decide further on the implementation level details. Let's look at SCMI server. So how are you going to set up an SCMI server? Your TFA or the SCP firmware is going to be your SCMI server. And all of the other components are going to be your clients. So first thing is you'll need a shared memory address. So what I've chosen here is the address of the shared memory region and the size of the shared memory. Um, all these functions are called from inside your SCMI base driver, which is inside ARM trusted firmware. So if you look at uh, the very first function at the top, which is the SCMI init agent channel, that you have to call from the platform init function, which is the, one of the first things that gets executed in your boot flow. Uh, after that, you have various functions that describe your vendor name, sub-vendor name, then the number of protocols that you're going to support, which uh, is described by the protocol count. Uh, the number of which all protocols you support can be given using the protocol list. So here, for example, I've returned SCMI protocol ID clock, but you can return an array of all the various uh, protocols that you support. And finally, you have the message channel which you're going to use to communicate. Let's look at power domains inside TFA and SCMI. So the protocol mandates uh, on and off states at the minimum, but you can also support additional power states depending on your silicon. Uh, the protocol commands 
uh, take in integer identifiers to identify. So you have many number of power domains so inside your SOC. So you can assign numbers like 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on to identify which domains you want to toggle. And the necessity here is that your clock or SCMI IDs should always start from 0 and go up to n. And they cannot have gaps in between. This is what the protocol mandates. So here's how a sample power domain driver looks like. So you have the PD count, where uh, your ARM trusted firmware is going to tell Linux how many PDs you have. Then you can get the names of the PDs. You can get the statistics. You can get some of the attributes. And most importantly, you want to know the state. So is the PD on or off? And you also want to be able to set the state if you want to turn it on or off. Uh, here's clocking in TFA. So you can use this to basically enable or disable a clock. You can also set the rate and other configurations synchronously or asynchronously. You can get and set the parents of a clock. And it allows you to change the parent clock if required as well. So here's a sample implementation where you can get the number of clocks in the system. You can get or set the rates. You can get an array of the available rates that a particular, yeah, sorry. This is inside TFA. So right now I'm covering the ARM trusted firmware side of things. So all these drivers, Plat vendor, uh, have to be implemented by individual vendors today inside ARM trusted firmware. So um, these are the basic functions that you will want to implement when bringing up SCMI on your device. So uh, as I was talking about, so you get set rate, you can get rate, and you can also set the state. Now let's look at the Linux support. So for Linux, one of the first things, again, shared memory, because how is Linux going to know how do I talk to the other side? So I have set up the SRAM region in my SOC uh, as the shared memory. The compatible I have put as MMIO SRAM. And I've given the range. And I've marked it uh, compatible as uh, ARM SCMI shared memory. So now it knows that it has to use the shared memory as its communication medium. Um, Another thing that you would want is the uh, SMC ID. So many of you might be wondering, OK, this looks like a random number, 8200. What does it even mean? So here's how you would decide the SMC ID. This is again given inside the uh, ARM SMC document. And I've provided the source at the end of this talk. So uh, each bit here indicates what kind of system you would have. So uh, whether it should be preemptible, atomic, and then uh, what kind of ARM, ARM architecture calls. So you would have to decide after looking at this table which bits you would want to set. And that's how you would get to this number. Below that, I have declared the SEMI clock node and the SEMI power domain node. And as you can see, the protocol at the rate matches with the table that I showed earlier. So 14 is for clock, 11 is going to be for power domains. Here's just an usage example. Uh, borrowed it from the Juno SCMI DTSI. And uh, it's just an example of how your uh, child nodes can make use of clocks or power domains from SCMI. Let's look at some of the helpers. So let's say you implemented the both the side of things. And now your system is booting up. Great. But how do you know everything went well? Or maybe everything didn't go well? So let's look at that. So as long as you don't get uh, Fail to register error, as I've shown in this screenshot. This is one of the initial good indications that everything most probably went good. And then you can go reach the uh, uh, prompt. And then you would have to mount the debug file system. And then change the directory into clock or PD. I've given the path over there. You can view the state of all PDs. So as you can see, it lists down all these PDs. One thing to note over here is I have not put all of these nodes inside DT. But these have been discovered at actual runtime uh, with ARM ATF actually advertising to TFA of all the names of these PDs. So you can then go into the uh, location of, let's say, ADC0, and you can list. And then you can cat into the current state and take a look at whether it's off or on. You can also try to toggle it from here. Similarly, you can view the frequency and state of clocks, and also control 
these clocks and PDs as I talked about. However, this is something that is yet to be upstreamed um, and it is not supported today, but you can always go and uh, try to write on these debug FS to actually toggle the clocks and power domains. Yeah, it's, uh, it won't apply universally probably. Okay. Mm -hmm. so yeah, maybe it will be, yeah. Um, so after enabling the writable debug, uh, you can control it using these steps. So for example, I have put two megahertz as an example clock rate and then uh, once I cat it back, I can verify that it actually set it to that clock rate. Similarly for power domain, it was initially off and then once I echoed one into it, you can see that it has now turned on. Now let's look at uh, the second part of this talk, where I talk about the improvements and limitations of ARM SCMI. Starting with uh, implementing SCP in ATF. So if you're running something like RT Linux, where latency is very crucial for you, then uh, we are not able to preempt ourselves once we enter the ATF context. So the jump from EL1 to EL3 will happen, and then resuming back to EL1 will add some latency. So to mitigate this, one approach that I have found uh, is that we can run SCP inside SEL1 or, for example, OptiOS, which is preemptible from Linux. But the problem with this approach is we'll be limited to using that always as a trusted OS in which your SCP was implemented. Another problem is uh, that as I said, ARM trusted firmware advertises everything during boot time. So whenever your SOC is booting, it's going to go serially from zero to N and advertise all of the names, clocks, whether you're using it or not. So to reduce this time, we need to implement something called as lazy initialization, which is going to initialize stuff only on the fly for things that are actually being accessed by the system. This needs to be fixed from the Linux side, which uh, acts as your SEMI client. Then your clock parent selection, for clocks we should be able to select the parent clock, but currently inside TFA, uh, there's no support for this. However, inside Linux, uh, support was added recently, so at least half of the problem is solved. Another important thing is that TFA only supports 16 characters names today. However, uh, as you know, SOCs are incredibly complex. Your names tend to get really long sometimes, so uh, even though Linux supports extended names and so does the protocol, TFA needs to add support for this. Here's some of the upcoming developments in this uh, SCMI. So recently we are trying to add SCMI uh, pin control protocol support into Linux. Uh, as part of this protocol, we can redirect messages from your pin control subsystem into the SCA, SCMI platform firmware. So earlier where we were setting up pin muxes from Linux, you now have the option to do that from SCMI. So uh, although we are adding this in Linux, currently uh, in upstream ATF, there's no support for this yet. We may see this in the coming few months. And here are the references which I used throughout this talk. Um, you can refer to it later on. And the version info is that I've stuck to the SCMI v3.2 spec. Uh, Linux has been 6.9 RC3, and U-Boot or trusted from Veram as of April 24. Uh, special thanks to TI and the Linux Foundation for letting me talk about this topic, and I'm open for questions if any. Thank you. Very, very nice talk, firstly. Thank uh, you. Yeah, I had two questions. So first is, uh, what would be the need to implement uh, system controller in TFA, for example? Uh, why, why not do it as a Linux driver? I mean, what's the benefit? I can understand mm -hmm. the SCP because other processes, subsystems mm -hmm. may want to uh, turn on or turn off a shared resource, right? Mm -hmm. like, yeah, so that's the first question. Yeah, that's a good question. And it's the same question I asked before we dived into the SCMI world. Why can't we just have clock and power domain drivers in Linux? But as you see, in the embedded world, uh, we cannot be limited to thinking from a Linux perspective. There are a lot of other OSs out there, a lot of other RTOSs out there, which are going to be used on the same device. 
So why would you want to duplicate your efforts of rewriting those same okay. clock and power domain drivers across various platforms when you can have a central entity which is pretty much common to all of us? Okay, so it's more for convenience more than actual. Kind okay. of. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, the uh, the other question is: um, Does SCMI also allow reverse calling from like SCP to Linux? Or are there any calling conventions? Uh, no, of that sort? I don't think so. Just one way. Okay. Uh, at least I'm not aware of it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Anyone else? If not, then thank you. Thank you for attending.